Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I ought to make clear that we don't criticize uh, emerging research, we actually critique it and we place it uh, in context with other research on similar topics. So say it's on cardiovascular research, we will uh, place that evidence uh, in context with research over the last 10 years, for example, rather than looking at a piece of research in isolation. So after that very um, interesting historical uh, introduction uh, to uh, beer and how alcohol has played part in our lives for more than 9,000 years, I'm afraid my presentation is rather more dry and fact-based, but um, hopefully uh, you will find it of interest. So first of all, uh, the context of how much we drink, uh, just very, very briefly. Um, so on average, um, across the world, consumption, especially amongst developed countries, is declining um, or has remained stable over the last 25 years. Uh, it does vary. So within Europe, for example, countries such as uh, Belarus and the Czech Republic, consumption levels are as high as 14 litres per capita, according to WHO. And the lowest consumption in Europe is in Italy, for example, at just six litres. So there is variance. It's quite interesting to see the breakdown of where beer is uh, drunk versus wine and spirits. And the mean uh, per capita consumption worldwide is just six litres. So why do we need um, guidelines? Or what is their history? In fact, they uh, have only been with us since about 1979. They're a, a fairly recent uh, evolution. Um, and they are created um, really for three uh, key reasons uh, to help us sort of define uh, what a safe level of drinking is. Um, and across Europe, nearly every country has guidelines of some sort. RARA have uh, conducted a recent survey of how many European countries have guidelines on safe or low risk drinkings. Um, 15, for example, have specific guidance for uh, underage drinkers, those under the legal drinking age of uh, generally 18, but in some countries still 16. 25 have a guideline of not to drink when pregnant. And uh, universal guidance is on drink dry. What is interesting is that across Europe, there is no standard. We don't even have agreement on a standard drink. The very lowest, as you may see there, is in the UK, where a definition of a drink is just eight grams, right up to Austria, where the definition is 20 grams. There is a mean, an average, of about 11 grams across Europe. So generally, a drink is defined as 12 grams or 10 grams of alcohol. Um, but this is quite interesting in itself. And we find then, as a result, of course, it's that there is wide divergence as uh, what is therefore uh, defined as safe levels or low levels of uh, drinking um, across Europe. So it will depend. So for example, from uh, 10 grams as the lowest level uh, for women, for example, up to 32 grams. And from then it varies from 12 grams per day up to 48 grams. Some countries, such as the, as the UK, have a weekly guideline where we have 14 units, for example. We can't even agree on binge drinking uh, or what's uh, termed as higher risk drinking, and definitions across Europe vary from 30 grams right up to 84 grams. So this is quite an interesting slide, really, I think, which looks at why these are, were based on those 31 countries <laughs> being asked as to why they did publish low risk or uh, safe drinking guidelines. Um, and those with the three ticks were perhaps considered the most important. So to inform consumers about alcohol related risk, to help reduce accidents and risks due to the short term effects of intoxication and heavy drinking. Importantly, to encourage at risk drinkers to cut down and to understand the risks of drinking too much. 
also to help professionals to identify at-risk or higher-risk drinkers. And finally, to help consumers make informed choices. And this is how uh, that may then translate into those short-term and higher-term um, issues that are taken into account. So in terms of short-term risks, uh, we're looking at accidents and injury, uh, alcohol poisoning, and an increase in risky behavior. And when we're looking at long-term risks, we're looking at particular at risks of cirrhosis, increased risks of cancer, and uh, cardiovascular disease, such as an increased risk in hypertension. So what does a guideline look like? I've chosen uh, the Canadian guideline here because I think it draws together all those elements very well, also fits very nicely into one slide, which lots of them don't. Um, so here we have um, a higher risk threshold showing you that if you, on certain occasion, drink more than three or four standard drinks. So in Canada, for example, a unit is 13.5 grams of alcohol. So again, different again. So it shows you the risks of short-term drinking, of, of drinking more than the low risk guidelines. And then it then gives you a guideline, which is different for uh, men and women, as you can see, of uh, no more than two drinks a day uh, for women and no more than three drinks on most days to re reduce your long-term health risks. And then there are categories when it's safe, considered not safe to drink at all, such as when you're pregnant, undertaking uh, a job with responsibility, um, uh, engaging in aerobic sports, uh, combination with certain uh, medications, for example. So that is how then a country's guideline may come together. So as um, we, we have seen or uh, will see, there have been quite a lot of changes in guidelines or there are proposed uh, changes in guidelines that uh, are happening or have happened in particular since 2009. So the first change really has been the adoption or the, uh, the adoption of alcohol-free days. And as you can see here, um, Finland, Germany, Latvia, the Czech Republic, the UK, Luxembourg, Poland, Switzerland, and Austria have all introduced some concept of having at least one or up to three alcohol-free days. Now, we can argue if you're a heavy drinker, this is very sound advice. So after a heavy drinking session, the idea of what we call a liver holiday or giving your uh, liver up to 48 hours to recover is very good advice. Also, uh, to reduce the uh, risks of de dependency, if you're a heavier drinker, to be able to know that you can manage without alcohol uh, for one or two days a week is also very good advice. However, what about if you are a moderate drinker? If we look at the medical evidence, it's very much a message of little and often. So the health benefits of drinking as a, as a, as a woman, uh, one drink a day, or as a man, two drinks uh, a day, for those uh, blood thinning um, uh, benefits, and uh, small amounts of alcohol stimulate um, our livers to produce the good high-density lipoprotein uh, HDL, uh, which then in turn parts off the damaging LDL um, that is from regular and small doses of alcohol. The effect lasts for about 24 hours. There are additional um, benefits from some drinks which are higher in antioxidants, such as dark beers or some wines and traditional ciders. And again, those benefits are short term. Now, that doesn't mean that the protective uh, effect becomes stronger the more you drink. I must emphasize uh, that it is from as little actually as five grams a day. So it is very much uh, uh, between five and 20 grams a day that those protective effects take place. But so therefore we would ask around drinking days that there or non-drinking days that there is a better definition of when that is valid, that it is for those who drink more heavily or those who binge drink rather than the majority who do drink at moderate levels. Second uh, uh, change in guidelines 
has been uh, just a general reduction. And I think this is particularly interesting from Italy, where we've seen uh, a change there. One of the earliest guidelines in 1979, where uh, the recommendation was that a man could drink uh, two thirds of a bottle of wine and perhaps his wife have the other third and share it between them. Um, they actually revised slightly upwards, as you may see in 1986. And even in 1996, 40 grams a day for men and 30 for women. Uh, but then the most recent uh, advice coming out in 2014 is to reduce consumption to uh, two units for men and one for women. In the UK, we've seen a reduction, a halving of recommendations for men in 2016 from up to 28 units a week to 14. Um, in the Netherlands, again, a substantial uh, reduction, a, a message that it's safer not to drink at all or just up to one drink a day for men and women. In Denmark, too, um, a big reduction. Perhaps we need to understand why. Who, too, have now come out with a message that it is safer not to drink at all. Um, so what is undermining the evidence base, if you like, or is there a change in the evidence base uh, that we're looking at? There is a small number of very uh, vociferous and uh, highly influential um, authors published in a small number of journals who are undermining uh, the idea that small amounts of alcohol could be part of a balanced diet and lifestyle and even beneficial for adults of good health. Based along two theories, really. One is that of what we call the sick quitter, which is where um, those who don't drink uh, are or could be categorized as those who were uh, ill or heavy drinkers and have stopped drinking. Now, certainly over the last decade, that has not been the case, and our abstainers in studies are truly lifetime non-drinkers without the inclusion of what we could call sick quitters. The second theory is that moderate drinkers live longer because they tend to eat a better diet, they tend to be of a higher social economic status, they tend to be better educated, and therefore it's not down to the moderate amount of, moderate amount of alcohol that they're drinking at all. Now, it'd be very interesting to hear from Giovanni uh, at Di Cateno later, who has actually, he's studying 25,000 uh, Italians, for example, and has carefully removed each element of that protective diet and found that alcohol on its own is most responsible uh, for the protective um, element amongst those uh, who are living longer. So once that evidence is, or once those papers are published, it's very difficult to counter. So they are there. Uh, but we would argue um, that those pot potential confounders have been controlled for for many years, for over a decade now, and it is perhaps a desire to ignore those well-done studies and concentrate on some older, less well-done studies uh, that this supposed undermining of the potential health benefits of moderate alcohol consumption is being focused on. In addition, the big change has been a move away from um, all-cause mortality. So a risk, uh, our risk of uh, dying from any cause due to drinking to a specific focus in particular on cancer. Now this is, has to be understood really because cardiovascular disease still remains the number one uh, killer, but cancer has caught up and is falling very, very closely uh, behind cardiovascular disease. So it is natural that there will be uh, a focus on cancer uh, by public health when looking at the effects of alcohol. But it is important that we keep it in proportion. But if we look at those guidelines there, uh, big changes. The UK, um, less of an emphasis now, I'm pleased to say, on that message no drinking is safe for your health. Once another 
uh, look had been taken at the evidence. But in both Denmark and the Netherlands, we do have those messages as part of the guideline. There definitely is a clear link. There is no doubt that if you drink heavily for a prolonged period of time, you increase your risk of many cancers. There is also what we call a, a, a linear curve uh, with breast cancer in particular, where any level of drinking will increase your risk uh, to a small amount. But there is also considerable evidence for many cancers that it may again be dose respondent. But looking at the cancers that are listed in guidelines, we should look uh, carefully at some of the evidence there. So alcohol and breast cancer, as I say, a linear uh, link, but it's also closely linked to having adequate levels of folate in your diet and also maintaining a healthy body weight. They mitigate the effects of alcohol uh, considerably. Alcohol and colorectal cancer looks increasingly to be dose uh, dependent with a clear increase in risk at consumption above 30 grams of alcohol a day, which on the whole is within low risk and safe drinking guidelines. And I think with um, cancers of the upper digestive tract, it's very important to look at that, that it is the combination of smoking and drinking together that clearly increases risk, not alcohol consumption alone. So where uh, details or uh, specification is given on uh, cancer in particular, it should be uh, more detailed and uh, clear cut. The other clear move um, we've had, sorry, it's very difficult, you haven't got the screen in front of you, I'm sorry I'm having to look behind, um, is a move away um, from this, the physiological effects of alcohol on the body and more um, towards uh, a lifetime risk and increase of any alcohol-related disease. Now, this move uh, started in Australia in 2009, um, and it looks at the alcohol attributable risk over our whole lifetime as established uh, as a norm uh, that it is only acceptable uh, to look at a lifetime increase in risk of 1% or less over our lifetime. So almost trying to establish a no risk at all from drinking guideline. Um, now that is different from say somewhere like Canada or the older uh, UK guidelines, which looked at the J-shaped curve and established the risk threshold as the same for non-drinkers. So the cutoff point was where our risk or relative risk of death was the same as for those who didn't drink at all. Now, the reason why this is uh, very significant and perhaps worrying is that it leads to the same guidelines for men and for women. So in Australia now, we have a guideline of 20 grams uh, a day for men and women. And in the UK, we have a guideline of 14 units a week for men and women. Now, for various reasons, um, sorry, this is, this is just understanding um, how, um, I just want to go back for a minute, if I may. Um, this is just a, a graphic really explaining that relative risk uh, and the difference between the Canadian approach and that of Australia. I, can ex I haven't got time to explain that in depth. But what I would like to um, point out really are the physiological differences between men and women, which are extremely important to highlight. And if our guidelines move away uh, from this, um, then it must be detailed in, in the text as to why. The reason why the lifetime attributable risk becomes the same for men and women is because the risk of death from injury and risk-taking amongst young men is so much higher uh, than among women, and this is what le leads to this parity in lifetime risk over a lifetime. But if we look at physiological differences between men and women and our ability to deal with the toxicity and the breakdown of alcohol, then there are uh, firm differences. We have less of the 
enzyme in our stomachs and uh, liver than men, so we are less able to break down uh, the acid aldehyde and the breakdown of alcohol into harmless acetate and then into carbon dioxide and water. We have less available body water. So there are uh, important differences that, and we feel a, a different guideline for men and women is something that should be maintained. Another recent evolution in guidelines, uh, which you may have noticed, uh, for example, for Italy, and have just crept into the US guidelines um, uh, for older men, uh, are lower guidelines for older populations. This is a, based on uh, two premises, that older populations have less available body water again, and they're more likely to be taking medications that could uh, interact with alcohol. Now, as we know, with cardiovascular disease or the potential health benefits from uh, moderate drinking, they only kick in uh, with men over age 40 and with uh, postmenopausal women. So um, we feel uh, at the moment only seven countries have some level of different guidelines for older populations, but we feel that the evidence base uh, for this is not strong at all, and indeed the evidence base is extremely strong for um, uh, low risk or safe drinking guidelines holding true for those o over the age of 60 and 65. Uh, and I've cited some of the evidence there that you might like to look at in your own time. There have been a few changes uh, that you may see as more positive. We know that it's very important uh, if we choose to drink that it's much, much better to drink with food and at meal times than it is to drink on an empty stomach. It is surprising how few guidelines take this into account. So Hungary and with the new UK guidelines, there is a mention of drinking with food. There's clear evidence that drinking moderately at meal time not only stops alcohol from rushing into your bloodstream and therefore gives your liver more of a chance to deal with any alcohol um, you are ingesting, but there's also evidence to show that drinking at meal time, especially with a rich diet, reduces oxidative stress and um, uh, helps with um, health outcomes, positive health outcomes. Um, the second, I think, more realistic and important uh, definition is to, to include some sort of recognition that at parties and on special occasions, consumers will drink more and to have uh, a realization of that in guidelines and to have what we see perhaps as a, as a safer upper limit that can be uh, uh, enjoyed on certain occasions and defining that. So we would say that those maximums on special occasions and actually defining what we call binge drinking is very important. The pattern of drinking is just as important. You may have a consumer drinking the same number of grams of alcohol over a month. Uh, somebody through binge drinking, drinking say once every two weeks and going out and perhaps having 12 or 15 units or more and a moderate drinker who's drinking small amounts every day, their health outcomes will be very, very different. And it's something we find quite frustrating uh, at uh, the International Scientific Forum for Alcohol Research and at AIM, that often the pattern of drinking is not taken into account. If you binge drink, you lose all the potential benefits of small doses of alcohol over time. So I suppose the bottom line is, is has the evidence base changed uh, that informs responsible or low-risk guidelines, um, not only across Europe, but across the world? And we would argue that it hasn't. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, Bell uh, and Bobak uh, review uh, in the BMJ in March that followed uh, the heart health of over 2 million uh, patients. And it has really strongly reaffirmed uh, the J-shaped curve for moderate doses of alcohol, not only for myocardial infarcation for um, uh, heart attack, but also for angina and for ischemic stroke. So if we look at that J-shaped curve, this is what we mean. If you're a non-drinker, your risk of dying is there at the top of the line. As you drink small amounts of alcohol, and if you see the effect starts 
to kick in from as little as five grams a day, but is effective up to 20 or 25 grams a day, then your risk of dying decreases as you drink small amounts of alcohol and then increases rapidly as you move into drinking heavily. There hasn't been any evidence to undermine this J-shaped curve for all-cause mortality, but it will differ by disease. So we do have J-shaped <coughs> curves for late onset diabetes, for example, uh, for cognitive uh, function, for um, CVD, and all-cause mortality. But you won't see it, for example, as I've mentioned, for breast cancer risk. And there you will see another J-shaped curve. So it's important, really, that we stay informed um, and keep um, the relative risks in balance. There's no doubt that if you're a heavy drinker and you cut down your risk to moderate drinkers, then your health uh, outcomes will increase significantly, especially around your risk for cancer. But if we ask a low risk or a moderate drinker to cut their consumption down to occasional drinking or to not drinking at all, as public health, we cannot say that that is a good message or a valid message. It will not lead to increased longevity. Uh, long longevity, sorry, <laughs> it's coming out. Um, uh, so we, it is very, very important that we stay aware of the facts and the evidence that is there. One minute, but just so, so the importance finally is to keep um, the message of uh, low risk drinking in context of other um, healthy behaviors, such as exercising regularly, staying slim, eating a Mediterranean style diet, and the biggest modifiable risk factor, of course, is not smoking. So very important that we keep all that in context and um, in mind. So just to conclude, really, it's not the evidence base that has changed. It's really the focus of public health and those reviewing guidelines that has changed away from all-cause mortality and effects, our physiological effects and effects on blood alcohol concentration more towards um, uh, a lifetime risk of any alcohol attributable disease with a particular focus on cancer. So we must bear that in mind and be vigilant if you like and just be aware of all the emerging research. And if we can help you in any way or if you want to keep on top of uh, the emerging research. AIM publishes a journal 10 times a year, and uh, ISFA issues critiques on important emerging papers on a rapid response basis. Thank you very much.